Okay, we'll call the meeting to order. Record of attendance. Thank you, Linda. That's <coughs> Jeff's. Any declaration of the conflict of interest, anyone? An approval of agenda. So I have additions 9A, porta potty, 9B, hostel shelter, 9C, litter, 9D, purchase of books. What else you got? Come on, Deputy, you don't let me down today. <laughs> I wasn't. I I couldn't sleep last night. Okay, so um, and I do have something in camera. Do you have something in camera? I have one thing. Thank you. Moved and seconded. Discussion. Question. Questions been called. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Contrary. Motion carried. <clears throat> so we have a number of presentations today. Amber's. Don Germont is first with regard to the art project. The colorful, vibrant, beautiful art project. <laughs> so Amber, if you want to make your way up front, it, you have, um, we have to time people today, so you have about 10 minutes. <laughs> Landscaping, yeah. 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 Yeah, the grand fondue, yeah. yeah. Right on. I love it. So, okay, so um, I'm going to ask our CAO, what are, what color do you prefer? <laughs> I know you knew I was going to ask that. I'm, I'm going to ask, like, what, what does Amber need to, I mean, we, we'd have to take a vote to say that, 
you know, we're okay with it. I, I personally, I love it. The color. And, and there was, sometimes it was one bike, but sometimes it was like two or three or whatever. Like, right. and, and to put like flowers in it and just the life it would bring to Main Street. So a red, white, and blue Acadian bike, yeah, what, with a story, yeah. yeah. How cool is that? Yeah. Okay, so I'm, I'm asking our CAO what, what we would need to do, because there must be some type of permission that has to be granted. Oh, I'm sorry, your light's not right. right. So, so this is art, right? <clears throat> okay. So, <laughs> just want to be clear. <laughs> it's, not my, it's not my strength. It's not my strength. Uh, it's not a sign. It is uh, so. Uh, as as far as a public art installation goes, that that could be at council's discretion. You've done that before with uh, with uh, other visual art. So, um, you know, concerns that that you might have in terms of a sidewalk installation would be would be just pedestrian uh, mm -hmm. movement and safety. So as long as these are installed in a way that doesn't impede uh, pedestrian movement. I like the idea of putting them on the bike racks, frankly, because there aren't enough bikes on the bike racks, and it might you know, plant, hey, these are bike racks. So, um, but yeah, I, I'd say at your discretion, uh, and if you, if you agree to this, maybe we could ask that, uh, that Amber work with uh, public works staff on the installations to ensure the concerns that I, that I mentioned around pedestrian <coughs> safety are addressed in the installation process. Perfect. Good. Any more questions? Sandy? Thank you. <coughs> Amber, is this also something that businesses can actually do for themselves? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. Yeah. So we would want the businesses to work with our staff as well. Yeah. So the same thing when you're talking to them, we, we would want them to work with us, yes. with our staff, so that, and it's just the safety thing, right, to make sure everything's, everything's good. So we don't, so, so now you're on a timetable and we don't make decisions on presentations at the meetings. So when would we get to this? So, so you, could, you could refer this to the council meeting uh, coming up in a couple of weeks, <coughs> a couple of weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I would suggest that it might be appropriate to have a, a simple agreement around each installation. And, and I'm thinking because we're not just dealing with, with, with Amber, we're dealing potentially with other people wanting to to participate, um, you know, Amber's thought about thought about the aesthetic and what happens when these these bikes will be out in the weather and how they might look in, in the future. If somebody wasn't as as thoughtful about that, and we had a bike that became a bit of an eyesore or was vandalized, we'd want the ability to have that installation specific installation removed. So uh, perhaps we can work on an agreement if council agrees to to allow for mm -hmm. these. And and so. In doing so, we're aware of every installation, and, and we can have clear terms uh, with with each each artist. Okay, good. So, does anybody have any? There you go. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, go ahead. so, I'm just catching up. But who, so, who's going to look after them? And what about the individual store owners? And that aren't they? Are they not going to have a stake in? Beg your pardon. They obviously run. Yeah, you'll have to get their per you'll get their permission. Yeah. But you're going to do all the work yourself. Yeah. Oh, okay. So they're not going to be obligated. To, they're not going to be obligated yeah. To and, and, and so what are you going to do in the fall? What are you going to do in the fall? Well, winter, I should say, but in the winter time. Okay. Yeah, then we'll do sleds. Good. So, so it'll come to council in uh, what are we? April? Are we May now? March? It'll come in April, and then we'll. Yeah. There's. Uh, I don't see any concern. We just have to bring it to council and 
the rules say we can't decide here. Are you allowed to ask? Yes. Go right ahead. Exactly. Good stuff. Thank you, Amber, very much. Good stuff. <clears throat> okay, so we have um, we have reports from each of our managers, presentations, and there's there's quite a number of them. So I'm hoping we can stick to ten minutes or less each. I know that's a lot to ask, but otherwise we'll be here till tomorrow morning. Yeah. So, <clears throat> right on, Gil. Welcome. That's a tough act to follow. It is, isn't yeah. it? I remember when I used to have that kind of energy. <laughs> and you still do. You did the facade program, yeah. you and your team. Anyway, I'm here today, of course, on behalf of the Mariner Center. I think you've previously been received a copy of yep. the, uh, the annual report and the budget submission, including the capital and... Can you grab the microphone, Gil? Sorry. Okay, not a problem. Thank you. Okay, I'll start over. Um, <laughs> So you, uh, I think you've, you've uh, had the, uh, the annual report and the uh, operational and, and uh, capital budget submission um, circulated some time ago. I'm just here basically to answer some questions and point out any highlights. Um, uh, on a positive note, uh, I believe this year we're tracking to come in under budget, so uh, we've had a good strong year, a good strong finish to the year, um, and that's good news, um, but um, it's, it's, it's always a challenge. So I'd um, be more than happy to, to respond to any questions you may have regarding any of the issues in the budget or in the, in the capital. Questions for Gail? I have one. Sure. And I have, it's just coming out of the blue. The heat recovery piece. I know that Argyle had, and Alain can correct me if I'm wrong, but you would put money aside. Yeah, and I think ours might still be there. Like what, do we? Is there a time frame where you go back and you ask the same question? Um, well, actually, I did, I did submit a request through ACOA again last year through the 150 program, and we were denied uh, funding for that. But um, originally, there was a plan um, for three municipal units, um, not on an equal basis, but cost sharing the project. Um, and then when the, when the price of oil dropped and the return on the investment period um, became a little longer, um, the municipality of the District of Yarmouth elected to uh, not proceed. Yeah, so that's, I guess that, that was my question in, in timing. So for example, at the council table, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure you will. Um, at the council table, you can make a motion and then you can't come back for a year and you know, make that same motion. So I guess I'm asking, is it worthwhile to ask the three of us again? I don't know, is it within the time frame or is it even, I, I, it's such a good project, I'm just wondering. Well, from, from my perspective, I mean, it's one of, I realize that it is an expensive project, but it's one that's I going see. to help green the facility, and I believe that um, 
you know, the price of oil has now began to rise again. Um, yeah. You know, at the time we first submitted the proposal, I, I think it was over 95 cents. It dropped then to 43 at one point, um, but I think we're up around 75 cents a liter now for furnace oil. So at that amount, I think we'd still save about $50,000 a year in our fuel budget. Wow. Okay. 50000 I believe it, in today's prices, I believe it would be about 50000 a year. So, um, <clears throat> if, I guess I'm thinking about this, and we've, Jerry and I have talked about this project lots over the last few years, that the, although the payback on it is, is not what it would have been at 90 odd cents a, a liter furnace oil, it's still not bad. And, um, you know, we compare it to other projects that we've recently agreed to, like solar, uh, solar projects, the payback is, is considerably better. I wonder if, you know, if the partners, and it was not an equal partnership we were talking about in the past in terms of everybody participating, am I correct? I believe the, there was participation from all three municipalities, and I think it was equal, equal shares on the municipality of Yarmouth and the town of Yarmouth, if my recollection is right, and the municipality of Argyle, although weren't obligated, had uh, agreed to contribute some money towards it as okay. well. So I guess what I'm suggesting is, if it makes if it makes sense to do it, uh, to us and maybe to Argyle, maybe not, um, but maybe not to the municipality. Or I'm just wondering if it's possible to put the project together and get it going, uh, even if the shares are not equal. You know, maybe the town's willing to take a greater share if the benefits are are shared disproportionately as well. Um, well, I can tell you that we've maintained contact with Simcoe, who we've, uh, at this present time are the only suppliers that uh, would probably be able to provide that service in the province. And you'll see that um, the <coughs> heat recovery project is still listed as a priority in the capital at 490000 and I have confirmed that that price is still accurate. Okay. Talking. Yeah, so so I guess from I'm only speaking for for myself and and perhaps uh, reflecting uh, Jerry's perspective on this as well. But if there's a possibility of bringing three partners together under some formula, whether it's equal or not, or even two partners together, um, I and Jerry would be prepared to bring a a proposal back to this council for for serious consideration because we believe in the project. So maybe we can work with, with you, Gil, to see what might be possible. Hopefully we'd get a equal sharing, you know, kumbaya deal. But if we couldn't get that, I think there's still, it's still a good project. Yeah, I, th I think, you know, uh, just your environmental conscience, um, you know, it's good for the planet, it's good for the community. So, um, and, I, and I think it's, it's nice when you have an infrastructure project that actually shows a return on the investment. Um, sidewalks don't normally do that, <laughs> so. Yeah. Okay. Good. Any more questions for Gil? Good stuff. Thank you very much. That was easy. <laughs> hey, thanks for your time. Thanks, Gil. Okay, Neil. Welcome. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Everyone can hear me, I think. Okay. We can. Um, I'm just going to quickly uh, thank you for uh, inviting me today. I'm going to quickly go through my uh, presentation. I do have my timer on here, and I'm going to try to uh, be aware and present of the time I'm allotted and, uh, and be out of here within uh, 10 minutes or so. But uh, uh, here, we, here we go. I'm just going to start um, um, this presentation by describing some of the uh, plans that, or some of the things we've done in 2017. Uh, and also describing some of the things we plan to do in, in uh, 2018, some of the things we've already done. So I'm just going to start with a uh, one-minute video.
So Those stars are goosebumps. I have to every. <laughs> I've watched it a hundred times. Every time I get goosebumps. It's really good, but it's really loud too. Oh the speakers are, are vibrating, but <laughs> I couldn't handle that today. Couldn't get that. To <laughs> uh, I'd like to just show that video off because it kind of touches on one of the main um, um, brand resources and brand components that we have in our in our. In the, in we're describing everything to Canadian Shores, and one of them is trying to leverage our Starlight designation. So that video was really obviously designed to try to leverage that and try to get people to realize that. The Yarmouth and Acadian Shores region is a great place to do stargazing, and uh, we've tried to actually start developing pro uh, experiences around that, that, uh, that designation. So before I move into 2018, I'd like to uh, discuss some of the uh, things that have happened in 2017, and uh, I think some of you probably know that we've had a great year in tourism. Um, in 2017, Nova Scotia's tourism industry had its best year in history and its fourth consecutive year of growth. In all, a record 2.4 million visitors came to the province in 2017, and tourism uh, revenue for the year is estimated at 2.7 billion, um, and that ref that's from Tourism Nova Scotia's own, st own statistics. Nova Scotia also welcomed an additional 195,000 non-resident visitors to the province, and this was an increase of 9% from 2016. Increases in visitation were also observed across both road and air. In 2017, licensed room night sold in Nova Scotia was 2,760,000, and increased, and increased by 2% compared to with 2016. The occupancy rate increased by 3% to a percentage of 55%. Now looking at uh, Yarmouth and Acadian Shores in comparison to the province. In 2017, licensed room nights sold in Yarmouth and Acadian Shores was 68,000. This was an increase of 4% over 2016. And the occupancy rate, meanwhile, increased by 2% um, to 47%. For the Yarmouth and the Yarmouth Room Levy had its best year uh, since its inception, and, and yet the ship was down a lot of the time. Imagine right. those numbers. Correct. There, there was uh, there was estimated numbers uh, higher than than the uh, the ferry had had uh, projected yeah. or sorry ended up with. That's uh, great. But the engine engine issue did have an impact on room nights. Mm -hmm. uh, although they did they did try to accommodate people through the uh, Fundy Rose uh, passage, but uh, we did lose some room nights because of that <coughs> event. Room nights sold. Uh, I'm not sure why those two numbers are, are varying, but the well, occupancy. Well, this is the occupancy rate is, is based well, on. Because rooms don't equal percentage. Well, that's an average. No, rooms room nights do not room equal sold. percentage. Room nights are just the amount of rooms that were sold. Occupancy rates is, is the rate of the rooms that were sold against the rates of the, the rooms that were available for the property. And so it's a it's a ratio. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. we're at 47%, the province is at 55, so it's pretty comparable, it's tracking well. The, the room levy, when I refer to the room levy, I'm really referring to the three, uh, the four properties in the town that have 20 rooms or more, and those uh, properties actually account for uh, probably just over 90% of all the rooms in the whole region. So, when the province talks about Yarmouth and Acadian Shores, they're also including Clare, uh, but they're also rounding some of those numbers, so. But still, even with Clare in, in, included in the, in the numbers, Yarmouth and Acadian Shores, the 90% of the rooms in the, in the region are located in the town that are paying into the levy so, as well. The uh, total room night sold for Yarmouth was uh, 4%, and the average daily rate, which is, again, uh, another metric that we're using to try to get a snapshot of the, the health of the tourism industry, was, was 6%, and that was an up in 13% when compared to 2016. So things are moving in the right, right direction, that's for sure. Uh, some other things that we did in 2017, of course, is we did uh, marketing, and uh, we, ha we have some metrics to share with you to uh, describe some of the achievements we had there. For the last two years, YAS has participated in the digital marketing campaigns in partnership with Tourism Nova Scotia. The 2017 digital marketing campaign surpassed the 2016 results, and we were successful in generating over 1,890 referrals to our operator sites and over 5, uh, 580 uh, referrals to ferries.ca. We also did some Facebook advertising and uh, display ads in our New England market. We Our video views, which uh, some of those videos were actually 15 second snippets of those uh, Starlight videos that you just saw, were viewed by over 12,000 people in the New England US market. 
and over 28,000 uh, people viewed the videos in, in our Canadian markets. Our Facebook ads reached over 175,000 people in 2017. So as you can see, uh, each year, Yarmouth and Acadian Shores works to promote our destination to potential visitors uh, in key markets, including the US, Ontario, Quebec, and Atlantic Canada. And we're only able to do these key markets, or only able to reach these key markets through strategic partnerships uh, that enable us to extend our marketing reach and impact. For 2018, YASTA will be per, uh, partnering with ACOA, Bay Ferries, uh, Experience Acadie, Tourism Nova Scotia, Tyans, and Tuscan Ford. Uh, just to name a few. And of course, YASTA will be partnering with our local tourism operators to, to, on a project by project basis. Um, YASTA, uh, to complete in markets we would normally not be able to reach, uh, but also leverages our partners' and investments and delivers more in return. So, strategic partnerships are really critical for us because it allows us to leverage the money and your investment in Yarmouth and Acadian Shores. If we didn't have our strategic partners, we wouldn't be able to uh, certainly do our product development work that we do and certainly leverage the uh, the marketing dollars that we are given. So it's really important. Um, YASTA will be participating in the following marketing efforts in 2018. We'll be doing some online marketing, of course. Uh, the goals for our online marketing are to create online awareness for Yarmouth and Acadian Shores using video and social content promotion, support the awareness tactics um, with search marketing, so these who, those who become aware of Yarmouth and Acadian Shores will be able to find us and act on uh, any of those um, marketing tactics. For our online marketing, uh, our online marketing includes managing our digital content and creating engaging digital content to use on the following marketing channels. Uh, they would be, of course, our website, yarmouthandacadianshores.com, novascotia.com, fairies.ca, discoveracadie.com, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, uh, and we also do some email marketing. Yes, so we'll also be participating in online marketing campaigns that will include partnerships with Experience ACT, Google, Canada, and uh, Tourism Nova Scotia, and potentially a campaign with Bay Ferries as well. These digital campaigns uh, will use proven tactics, including Google search keywords, uh, Facebook and Instagram display ads, and YouTube pre-roll video to reach our targeted markets. As always, YASTA will also be working with partners such as Tourism Nova Scotia and Experience Acadie to develop new digital content to populate these online channels with new and engaging content. The content will include new photography and video. Last year, in partnership with Tourism Nova Scotia and the Inspiring Content Program, we were able to capture this amazing image of the Yarmouth waterfront. Well, we're very pleased that this image has been chosen as one of, one of the covers of the Tourism Nova Scotia Doers and Dreamers Guide for 2018. And uh, this, this, having this on the cover of the Doers and Dreamers is really an example of why we need to continue to invest in digital content yeah. and keep making sure that our content is fresh and uh, engaging and gets a reaction and because we can get results like this. So, Some of the other things that we do, um, this is a picture of Charles and I. We just got back from Boston in February. We were at the Boston Travel Show. Um, we attend lots of trade shows and consumer shows as well. This year we're, we went to the Boston Globe Travel Show, the AAA Boston Globe Show in um, uh, just outside of, of Boston near the, it's actually at Gillette Stadium. Um, we're, I'm going to be attending Rendezvous Canada 2018 at the Convention Centre in Halifax in May. That's a travel trade show, um, directly selling to travel trade. And we're also going to be attending the Saltscapes Expo in uh, 2018. And one thing I forgot to mention too is we're going to be going to the Portland Old Port Festival, which is a one-day event in Portland. We also produce print and uh, print, co print collateral, uh, kind of a traditional uh, method of reaching uh, customers. Um, we produce the Doers and Dreamers content pages and our co-op pages for Doers and Dreamers in both French and English. We also produce a uh, French and English activity guide. Uh, we also do uh, lure pieces for trade shows and we're also doing this year standalone maps of the region and the, and the town um, and to use as marketing piece, pieces. One of the other tactics we use to uh, bring people to the region is travel media and social media influencers. Each year, YASTA works with the province and Bay Ferries to bring travel media and social media influencers to our region. We also work with Portland radio stations to bring radio personalities uh, here as well and experience our region. This year, we will be hosting travel media from Rendezvous 2018 and Town Square Media in Portland, Maine, who operate five radio stations in the Portland market. Past social media influencers have included hectictravelers.com and delightfultravelers.com, both um, huge followers, followings online. 
Uh, one of the other things that YASTA also does is we work with industry uh, to work towards um, building and enhancing the visitor experience for visitors once they're here. So we facil facilitate familiarization tours, frontline staff training um, in both Yarmouth and Portland and with Bay Ferry's crew, we do familiarization tours uh, for the region. So what that is is really making sure that if someone were to ask a front desk clerk um, where's a good place to eat, where's a good place to, to do a starlight experience or, or take a uh, harbor tour, for example, they're able to actually communicate that uh, rather than just shrug their shoulders and say, oh, I don't know. You know, we want to make sure that they're, they're armed with that information. So last year we did a little bit of that at the, at the Grand Hotel. We actually ran a couple of sessions. Um, Monica McNeil with Bay Ferries, we both went to Portland and did the same thing with frontline staff there. So those are hotel workers, uh, front desk staff. Um, Is it working? Is it's, it, it's, it's, it's getting better. I have, you know? I have to ask, because there's nothing worse than somebody coming and saying, well, we were asking about, and, right. you know, oh, there's nothing to do in Yarmouth, or there's no tours, there's no, you know. I think, I think what happens with those is that those are negative, so they often obviously get shared. Yeah. What you don't hear about is the 90% of the time people get a good experience because they've been recommended something okay. by somebody else. So uh, take those with better. a grain of salt. But we're, <laughs> we, I am aware of those, and those do, uh, those do irk me, that's for sure. Yeah. So. Uh, one other thing that YASTA does is we do visitor servicing. So we have a partnership, uh, with, a strategic partnership with Bay Ferries, uh, where we actually operate uh, a section or VIC on the Cat Ferry. Um, we hire the staff, they're local people, they're trained with uh, the VIC staff here in Yarmouth and we train them and they, they work full-time seasonal work on the ship, so that's two full-time seasonal jobs on the ship. Um, it's a great opportunity to influence people's uh, travel agendas and their, their itineraries because often they're looking to, for example, travel the, you know, you know like get to Cape Breton basically in two days and, and then come back on the ferry, so we have an opportunity to kind of extend their stay really influence their itinerary, which is a lot of what we do there. We also book rooms and experiences uh, right through our VIC on the ship. This is a picture of the, some of the gang from last year. We have videos and uh, displays and iPads on the ship, and that's all our infrastructure that we actually put on the ship and, and operate. We, we still own it, but uh, it's a good partnership with Bay Ferries, and uh, it's, it's paying dividends. We also do a mobile VIC. Um, this is a partnership with a local car, de car, car dealership, Tuscan Ford. And uh, what we do here is we have our summer staff basically go to places where visitors are. So either um, like a festival experiences, or... festivals. Yeah. Um, you know, we were part of uh, um, sh uh, Shift last year, the event doing that, uh, the car show, any experiences or events, we try to have them at and go where visitors are and then do the same thing, kind of try to coax them to do other experiences, make sure you can answer their questions and, and let them know about other experiences that are there. So that's been a great partnership for us. Mm. So moving on here, finishing up, I'm being aware of time. I just wanted to mention some of the new experiences that we can all look forward to each year. Each year, uh, since I've been with the Yarmouth and Acadian Shores, we've seen more experiences grow and grow and grow. And it, that's a really good indicator that our tourism uh, industry is growing. This year, um, um, I'm proud to say that we have some new products and experiences to, uh, to talk about. So um, new and enhanced experiences for 2018, we have Savor the Sea at the Yarmouth Bar and Cape for Shoe. So that's a... Uh, this picture here is a, is a picture of a lobster, lobster, seaside lobster supper with craft beer, local craft beer and wine. And uh, this is right at the actual bar in, in, uh, on the way to the lighthouse. So this is dockside. So this is exactly what our, some of our visitors have already told us and Tourism Nova Scotia has told us our visitors are looking for. So it's great to be that we're going to be able to actually deliver that again. This is a, a really enhancement for our for experiences in our region. So we're quite happy with the see this one happen. Um, this actually ran at the lighthouse last year and they had over 100, 100 visitors um, partake in the experience. Um, we've moved it to the Yarmouth Bar this year um, because we're actually going to have a new experience at the Lighthouse as well. Um, the same type of thing is going to happen at the Lighthouse uh, at the Keeper's Kitchen. So. Uh, Music of the Bay and Living Wars, we have, we've had enhancements with our signage and our auto harm marketing. Um, the foodie walking tour is actually going to extend the tour by one day this year, so it's actually going to be going three days a week rather than two. And the East Coast Paddle Company is going to be operating a tour of the Yarmouth Harbor called Paddle in a Pint. So uh, go for a stand-up paddle for an hour, um, leave the water um, very safely, of course, and then go to a local establishment for a craft beer and a, a light bite. These are really cool experiences, and we're glad to see them grow. Um, we also have uh, um, Yarmouth Harbor Tours. So Yarmouth Harbor Tours is going to be operated by Simon Lucien Leblanc from Tuscan Island Tours. They're actually going to be operating this tour. It's, 
approximately going to be a one-hour tour of the Yarmouth Harbor, a uh, smaller boat, but it's still going to be really great. And uh, they're actually partnering with the Savor the Sea on Wednesday nights to actually include in that experience a Yarmouth a, a harbor tour. Then you get off the boat right at the Yarmouth Bar. Then you have your lobster supper oh, dockside. That's right. And you get yes. back on the boat and come back to the Yarmouth, uh, Yarmouth uh, dock. What so it's really experience. great for walk-on passengers. So mm -hmm. we're quite pleased with that one. Great experience. Yep. Uh, we tested it uh, in the October last year. It was a little cold, but it, we tested it and it was great. So. We also saw that the, the, uh, Yasta didn't really have much to, to do with the uh, development of the craft breweries, but we do have uh, three craft uh, breweries in town now in the community, and these are great uh, icons and things that people, visitors are looking for. Certainly a segment that we call the um, uh, Free Spirits is looking for types of, of, of things like craft breweries, and they, uh, it's really an exploding around the province right now, so it's a really good thing that we have these here. These guys, these breweries are very willing to partner to create experiences, so for example, Paddle on a Pint, I think uh, she might be actually partnering with Tuscan Falls Brewery as well, and uh, they're looking to all do certain, certain things like brewery tours. So one of the things that's kind of developed out of those, the fact that we have uh, breweries now is we're going to have a, uh, a wine and beer tour as well. It's gonna, you're going to be able to get in a van and go with a sommelier to other breweries and, and actually go around the region and experience local beer and food and uh, while they do all the driving. So that's another additional experience that's going to be happening here. So those are, those are you know, all good signs. And finally, uh, one of the, the, the newer experiences that just, just dropped was uh, called the Acadian Kitchen Party. This program actually came out of the accelerator program that Tourism Nova Scotia operates. So, so basically how that works is they have targeted, ex targeted ex experiences that they want to promote to um, their visitor. So Tourism Nova Scotia has done some extensive research and they know what types of experience Experiences visitors are looking for align the best. So things like, you know, having lobster at a lighthouse, uh, spending an overnight on, a, on an island, um, and uh, authentic cultural experiences like this Acadian kitchen party. These are things that visitors are looking so for. So Tourism Nova Scotia has kind of pushed that out and said, if you're an operator and you want to work with us to create these experiences, we'll be a partner for you in the marketing and the uh, content creation. So it's a really good win-win for a partner. Good deal, yeah. there's, there's very little money I don't think there's any money actually that an operator has to um, put forth. Um, you just have to be willing to actually offer the experience and then Tourism Nova Scotia takes it from there and markets it. So we've, uh, we were lucky last year to get one uh, approved and this is the one I'm going to show you. And this year we've also applied for three more. So we've applied for one at the Lighthouse, uh, one more at the Yarmouth Bar, that experience. And I think Tuscan Island Tours has also applied for this program. So hopefully we'll get it because when, when we do get these programs, when we're awarded these, the the experiences get a lot of great content and great marketing and uh, it really pays dividends. So, I'm going to finish up by just playing this last video and then uh, I'll take any questions if there are any. Like we take that, I mean, what we just saw, we take it for granted, right? But that's what everybody's looking for. Mm -hmm. Like seriously, it's the real deal. That that video really captures that story really it well. Does. What that is, and uh, yeah, that's a great location for it. So I'm hoping we can get more of these yeah. types of experiences really pushed out there. That whole lobster thing at the in Argyle is mm. okay. Good enough, Phil. Good presentation, Neil. Nice job and. You guys seem to redefine yourself every year and you get better and better at what you do. Um, what about the, uh, there's been a little buzz around, what about what kind of uh, program or attitude or vision or vibe that you can do about the, the movie being shot here in Yarmouth? Can you use some of that I think, promo? I think, I think you know, if we look kind of how Shelburne has kind of taken advantage of the opportunity that they had when they, the Scarlet Letter was shot there. Yeah, yeah. but they had some infrastructure left they there did. too, right? Yeah, that was, the, so it is a little bit different because we're not going to have, you know, uh, our infrastructure is not going to be archived, I don't believe anyway. Like you have like William, uh, 
the foe and Robert Pattinson, and then you have your starlights where the stars meet the stars. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It's, diff it's difficult to reach their, their people. You like that one, don't you? Um, but I, yeah. I, I can try. I have reached out on social media a few times to them to just you know, welcome them here and, and kind of do it that way to try to get some, some social media engagement out of it. But uh, I haven't been able to really generate any kind of buzz from Yarmouth and Katie and Shore's perspective um, with them. When will they get here? They're not here yet. But they're not here they're yet here. either. Right. And the other thing is, I know that you've lost one of your members out there of your family has taken another position. Is there going to be a redefinition of that job, or what do you see that role is entailing now? Well, it's it's been pretty it's been a quick, pretty quick announcement that 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 was happening, and so I've advised the board at my last board meeting, which was about a week and a half ago. Uh, Wade was there, and uh, they've this, we've decided as the, as the board and the organization that we're going to look at what we really need in the organization now. The, the role that that individual was playing with regards to group sales is still extremely important because we want to ensure we're still going after events rights holders and, and going after events. You know, certainly with hockey and curling and, and musical cultural events are still really important. But it's not necessarily a full-time job, I would say, within our, in our, in our, our office, the way we work. We certainly have a need for, for marketing. And with our tourism destination management plan, uh, some of the recommendations that are coming out, which I hope you all can attend some of those sessions, um, are going to really be pushing us a bit more in a direction where we're going to be working to ensure that we're doing more types of product development. So things like helping to create uh, the things like the Acadian Kitchen Party or so more So you work with operators and other right. groups. Working to, towards building our actual industry so when the visitors do come, there's more experiences here and they'll stay longer. Working on a season extension strategy, for example, trying to get them here uh, visitors to stay here longer than you know 2.2 days. We want to, we're going to start with hours and try to extend their stay by hours, and then eventually a day, and then yeah. eventually more days. So, so, so there's, there, we're still going to be so focusing on the event yeah. to, to we'll circle around. Off, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, Phil has said before from this table, you know, we, we look at Cape Breton and God love them because a lot, of, most of those people off the boat can't wait to get to Cape Breton, right? Um, but if we packaged. Yeah, I think if you go after bigger pots, you, of money, you right? think you look at. Uh, I think one of the largest tourism uh, grants or, or monies given is the uh, Celtic Colors, which gets over a million dollars in Cape Breton. And I think if you package all the events that we have here, from the uh, Amber was here earlier about the about the biking and Claire to Sea uh, uh, Fest, the Car Festival, uh, all the things that we do uh, in southwestern Nova Scotia, I think. Um, for what the government gives us is, is a pittance compared to what they pound into Cape Breton. I think if we had a, a tenth of what they get for money, I think we could really, really, really put ourselves on the map. And instead of that two point whatever seven billion, I think we really could up the ante, especially uh, Councillor Hood says it about Acadia National Park being right across the bay and hopefully in a couple of years that something about the boat might change and we go into there. I think we really have an opportunity to really redefine ourselves and, and almost uh, you hate to go back in time and say you know how things were in the 50s and the 60s but get that regeneration of interest with our American cousins into into the uh, Bar Harbor and into, into Maine right since mm -hmm. so it hasn't seemed to really it's working in Portland but I think Bar Harbor really 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 worked well mm -hmm. so anyways that's well, I don't know if we put that together I guess yeah, and I think that's another conversation maybe we can have with our other municipal partners about uh, that are involved in YES there about uh, going for a bigger ask instead of small individual what festivals or events going after their small little amount of money, um, combining them all and doing a... What would you do with a million bucks, right? Mm -hmm. Really? It'd be more than a 10-minute presentation. Exact JCAs. <laughs> JCAs. But, but seriously, right? I don't know that we've asked. They well, ask and they pound and they pound and they pound and they get a million bucks. And, and I'm thinking, you, you take like, how do you, you can't even, you can't beat the tuna festival. No, that's right. Right? You can't. It's worldwide. It's, it's so, and so you put all those things in a pot and you say, this is what we got. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just a, an offer to, if you want to think about it, we don't mind. You know. Yep. Uh, we, uh, there, right? I, am, I am still, just as a, an update on that. Um, one document that I have sent off to the Department of Business that has been back, referred back to mm -hmm. um, tourism, and I am in discussions with them. Discussions are ongoing with regards to that. Okay, uh, good. Two million that was, or eight million, that's two million a year for four years that was uh, allocated in the last provincial budget. Gotcha. So we're, I'm still working on trying to 
acquire some of those that. funds for infrastructure. Um, we'll see if that happens, but uh, if that happens, there may be opportunities for leveraging, it, certainly with partners, to yeah. do that. So, Good stuff. Yep. Good. Thanks, Neil. Thank you. Now, Neil took so long that I'm sorry the rest of you are going to have to. <laughs> and, and just so everybody knows, there's treats back there. Right, Linda? Yeah, there's treats back. There's coffee, but I think there's cookies and stuff like that. You okay, Carla? Do you need to make a pit stop? <laughs> Good stuff. Alain, you're up. When, you, when you're ready. Thanks again, Neil. Hi. Hello. So I trust you've received the action plan and budget for the airport. Um, this is unusual to be sitting here. Wild. <laughs> I'm just going to say that out loud. Okay, <laughs> moving on. Uh, We're glad it's you, though. Pardon me? We're glad it's you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, it's still early. No, you've done, <laughs> uh, you've done a lot. Thank you. So, um, so, so here's what's happened. So obviously, for not everybody's aware of the transition of, of, of management. Um, I'm the interim manager of the airport, interim being the operative word. It's a temporary uh, position to try to align the goals of the owners with the goals of the board and the airport proper. So uh, thus far, what we've done is, is uh, we've done quite a bit actually. We've started with an action plan. Uh, what, we, what happened this year is unique. Uh, we have been decertified from a 302 to a 301, which means that quite frankly, uh, we temporarily or permanently will not be able to accommodate regular passenger service. Now, the, those three words are significant together, regular passenger service. We can move passengers, chartered flights, we can move them in a lot of different ways, and we do, and we have. Uh, we, what we haven't, uh, what, we, what we have temporarily or permanently said is that we cannot do the passenger service on a regular basis. So some of you have been involved directly with this work where we have spent a lot of time and energy uh, taking a look at uh, the, the sustainability of that kind of service. Clearly it's a service that we used to have um, when it was subsidized by the federal government. And so that's, our, that's not our reality right now. And so what does that mean? It means that, uh, it means a couple of things. It means good and bad. So obviously you never want to say goodbye to an opportunity, but it also opens up other opportunities. Uh, under a 302 designation, the security aspects and the safety aspects that were required were, were extremely cumbersome. And so they were, they restricted how we could actually use the asset, quite frankly. So, so for instance, uh, where we have uh, a production company in the hangar, uh, if we were a 302, that would not be allowed under security and safety uh, requirements. So, um, I, you know, the fact of the matter is we didn't, you know, we didn't pull in that business because we were deregistered. But the fact that we were deregistered put us on the map for that type of business. So it does bring some positivity around the airport, around what it's capable of doing. So the long-term prognosis of the airport is unknown. Uh, what is required um, most definitely is a capital uh, infusion from the federal or provincial government. Recently received a presentation from the CBCL that essentially said, look, your, your main runway, which is the 0624, the longest runway you've got, uh, should be refurbished and, and not just crack filling. There really should be a, a significant job done to, to refurbish the runway and uh, their, their proposal would, would gain you 10 years. You can do something more significant that would gain you 25 years. Uh, they have not priced that as of yet. The other thing they said was the lighting is, the lighting, the approach lighting uh, for that runway is far beyond its useful life. And so we really, the board strategy and the board chair is, just so happens to be the mayor mood, uh, <laughs> strategy is to take a look at, okay, well, what is the service that's being provided at the airport that is critically important, not just to us, but, with the pro but to the province and to our, our neighbors? And we certainly landed very quickly on the safety and life-saving capacity 
and services that are currently occurring at the airport right now. About 22% of all landings of the airport have to do with either saving a life or protecting a life in Southwest Nova. Be it life flight because of a, of a patient in, at the regional hospital. Don't forget, we have the regional hospital here in Yarmouth, which means a lot of patients from Digby and Shelburne County, when they're, when they're critically ill, end up at the regional hospital. If they don't end up directly into Halifax for some, and so if there's issues that occur for all those people, life flight comes in. It's saving life in Lynn. There's no other way to say it. Um, Coast Guard has, a, has a, a very strong presence during our fishing season, which is District 34, District 33, and District 35. So that's Digby, Shelburne, Yarmouth, and everywhere in between. So the, the service that the airport is providing in terms of safety and security is something that we have not done a great job at promoting and, and reminding uh, the region. One of the objectives is to write to each of our, of our mayors and colleagues, the mayors, wardens, and colleagues of the municipalities of the counties of Digby and Shelburne to explain uh, this situation and, and the need for financial support. So we believe that this is our best bet to obtain capital funding uh, for the airport to protect its assets for the coming years. Uh, we, I cannot announce to you uh, the status of that funding. In the meantime, we have some short-term objectives that we um, have brought upon uh, the board, and I've attached the I've attached the uh, airport objectives uh, to your report. Just very quickly to talk about some short-term objectives we have over the next 12 to 16 months is uh, there's a lot of small things that we had to do, including adding uh, ultra-high-speed internet to the terminal. Um, participating in, in planning sessions with an SBI, uh, contact with Acadia First Nations, um, engaging the REN to investigate certain opportunities. A lot of those small objectives, and some of them are, are, are um, have, have been completed, like changes in pricing to increase revenue, et cetera. So you go on and on about the objectives. There's a lot of things that can be done at the airport. There's, uh, there's and as evidenced by the production company coming in and taking over the big hangar, uh, which means essentially all of our hangars and a portion of, of our storage facilities in, in the con combined service building as well as the terminal are being utilized. So the rental, what that's going on right now at the airport has never been higher. And so the other uh, element is that now that we're 301, the requirement to do safety management and uh, the requirement for a full-time airport manager is, is, is less of a requirement. So that's part of the reason why when we're presenting the financial statements to you and we're presenting the budget, is that we're presenting the minimum amount that the town and municipality of Yarmouth and Argyle uh, would pay. The minimum. So, the minimum. So the minimum, according to the four-year agreement that we have, which we're in our final year coming into this year, is $770,000, of which your percentage would be 30%. Uh, now, 770 is a bit fictitious because there's about 105,000 in property taxes that you get back, your portion. So the net amount is actually 770 minus 105 is 665. So that is the cost that we're asking uh, of the three municipalities. In the year prior, it would have been closer to a million. Mm. Uh, the 770 includes capital infrastructure improvements, um, specifically those that will result in reducing operating costs for the airport in the future. Um, so the, pres the, the budget that we're preparing for you is a, is a reduction of the budget that you have received last year. Uh, there's the budget does not include the anticipated success of obtaining capital funds for major refurbishment. So the budget does not com contemplate that at the moment. Uh, that's done intentionally because what will happen in, on a six to eight million dollar project is that the board will, will be receiving a recommendation to borrow its proportion of that uh, investment. And we're confident that if we get a, a sufficient funding from federal provincial governments, that uh, our proportion of that debt repayment will not be significantly different than the annual capital infusion that's required just to keep it going. 
So this is about actually investing in something that lasts as opposed to something that you have to do over and over again. So it's just, just being smarter with the money that we have available. Uh, we are in our last year of negotiation with the three municipal units, just so that you're aware of that. Uh, you will be asked or you'll be tasking your CAO to have conversations with your neighbors uh, around that. And uh, so that's important for the airport for its longevity is the understanding of that there is a secure municipal funding headed into the future. And I'll stop there and I'll, and I'll ask for questions because I think it's probably more interesting to hear you than it is to hear my own voice. Yeah, yeah. Any questions for Alain? Go ahead there, Cliff. Last night there was a doctor, I think it was last night, there was a doctor who was talking about the life flights and indicated that uh, it's a long haul from uh, Halifax up to Sydney or Halifax down to Yarmouth and all the way back and they're finding in their uh, emergency services thing there in Halifax where these people are taken to uh, that they're getting better outcomes with locals from the metropolitan area than they are with people who are perhaps uh, as much as five to six hours from their initial call to fly the aircraft up to Halifax uh, up to Sydney or down to Yarmouth, and he actually came out and said, you know, it'd be better if the two life flight helicopters were based one in Sydney and one in Yarmouth, yeah. from the experience they're having within the emergency department at Halifax. The outcomes would be better. I'm not surprised to hear that. Yeah. And uh, it might be an objective of the board or even political to start so, that process. So, of course, the, the reaction of somebody in the government was, but we have to have them in Halifax because we have serfs, whatever, and all that. But surely, if the medical professionals are of that opinion in terms of public health mm -hmm. and service to the people, somebody should chase that down a rabbit hole before it goes away. So that's going to get chased down at the next meeting. It's great. on my, it's great. On my okay. list. Great. I, just right. because you mentioned it. And, and it seems to me I just heard in the news today, maybe I read it in the Chronicle, you're the king of Chronicle, but somebody has asked, I don't know if it was Barrington or couldn't have been Barrington, but somebody asked for that lately, saying okay. it was at least a couple hours. Well, we're more than a couple hours, right? Yeah, there's, there, the, the stats are clear. Yeah. The, the number mm -hmm. one is Cape Breton in terms of life flight yeah. and medevac services, but a close second is Yarmouth, yeah. a very close second. And if you think about the population, it should not be a close second, right? Cape Breton, in terms of population, is 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 over a hundred thousand, you know, and fading. But however, that being said, so we're Tri County basically. We're Tri County, and uh, that would be about half the population. Yeah. But we're a close second in terms of service. So there, the, these services are being used. Yeah, and and the whole. Um, I mean, I know we're at the end of our four years, but I. I, I always go to that 22%, right? Like we've got yeah. fishing boats down here, and, and if you go over to the Cape, and then everybody says Dennis Point, right? So it's it's a the partnership's perfect for for the safety piece, that's for sure. Wade, um, thank you. Um, the life flights are, without question, hugely important, and obviously very very busy. That's 22%. And I think many people don't realize just how busy the airport is. Mm -hmm. What's the other 78 percent? Right. There's a lot there. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm just going to open up the, the statistics so I'm not going clearly by my, my uh, memory. I can tell you that um, the, here it is right here, just, just uh, bear with me one moment. So I can tell you that the that the other users include chartered flights, uh, which which can be commercial or or uh, co commercial flights, their own their own planes, their own planes that they own, or their their chartering flights. Most of that is for business purposes. So, uh, and I always use the example of of um, uh, boat building. Uh, there's a lot of uh, and lobster buying. So a, a lot of the traffic would include things like that. So somebody's coming to check their boat. Somebody's coming to uh, to make you know arrangements for lobster buying, etc. So that that represents approximately um, approximately 25 to 30 percent of the operation. 
the private club, there is private uh, recreational flights. So not only using our own plane, which there is a, a local uh, club that has a plane, it's also recreational flying. That represents, that's actually one of the bulk amounts. It's approximately 35, 40%. And uh, we also have other government services, such as military, so that will go up and down based on their activity. Sometimes they use our facility for touch and goes, and, and that can ra range. Uh, but uh, usually out of Greenwood, we see a lot of activity in that area. Now this year in particular, we've had the DNR and Coast Guard very, very active in the region. Um, they're doing some LIDAR mapping of our region, and they're using our facility uh, quite a bit more than they ever have, which is just, just a function of the work that, they're, that they need to do. So, so we have about between, between um, 12 and 1,500 flights in any given year, and that, would, that wouldn't include uh, years that we have air shows or any, like, or any sort of passenger service that we had in the past. So without any of that, we're, we're talking about 12 to 1,500 a year. Really, it's a lifesaver. It's it's an area where people are doing recreation. It's 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 busy, and it just drives me crazy sometimes when people question the value of it. Oh, how See, much? Yeah, but, and, yeah. And remembering, it's like it's like everything else. People hear what they want to hear. Yeah. Right. So if there's no passenger service, it's not a viable airport. Well, of course it is. And yet one life. What what we put in alone, it, the, you can't put a price on life. Our fishing is our mainstay. You've got to, yeah. you know. It, just to, just tired. A, a point on that is that it's it's a lot like the like us being us government being involved in, in medical clinics. Yeah. Uh, certainly, the initial thought when you think about government services is not oh medical services or yeah. airports. It's not the traditional mode of service. Many of our residents look for garbage, uh, sidewalks, and other traditional modes. So this, this is actually a passive, a more passive, uh, silent service, as opposed to an active and visible service. You know, when you, when you build a track and field, everybody sees it, everybody sees the value, right? So this one's a bit more difficult to nail down in terms of value, and I think it's one of those things where you only see the value after it's gone. And then you start right. realizing that there are things that were happening that you had no idea were happening exactly. at the airport. Uh, for instance, the Junior A uh, tournament that, that Yasta, who did a great presentation, um, that Yasta helped in organizing and coordinating would not have happened here if it wasn't for the airport. Um, the, you know, there are businesses, big businesses in this community that would not exist in this community if it wasn't for the airport. I was just going to say that one. Th these so, big businesses don't want to land in Halifax and drive three and a half hours. They want to fly in. They want the accessibility, and we don't have passenger service, but yeah. we do have accessibility. That's right. Thank you. Yeah, good stuff. We good? Thanks, Alain, very much. You're very welcome. Thank you for your time. Alain, real quick, though, what do we hear about the track? Do you hear anything? No. Funding in the fall of 2018 at the earliest, where we'll see new funding for this type of okay, thing. Okay, so that's so only that's a few months around. away. It will be the next round if if it is the next round. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to push for that. We need to push we need to push for that. We'll talk about it. We need to push your ante up. Yeah. Anymore. Exactly. Oh, we already emptied up, I think. We're good. Our money's there. Mr. Green. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I hope this is me here. It is. All right, I've seen your agenda, so I'll try and use as few of my allotted 10 minutes as possible. <laughs> uh, in Nova Scotia, we have a disposal goal of 300 kilograms per person per year, and that's a provincially mandated goal. Um, they thought we were going to make it there by 2015. Uh, spoiler alert, we have not, but we'll touch on that a little later. So what is disposal in Nova Scotia? Well, in Nova Scotia, disposal is everything that goes in the ground. And it's significant to note that because a lot of places, when they're talking about their disposal rate, they're just talking about residential. In Nova Scotia, it includes residential, all the waste from your industrial, commercial, and institutional sector, and also uh, construction and demolition waste. This one is particularly significant. Uh, waste Check and several other agents have been lobbying the province for a number of years to try and get C&D out of C&D waste out of the calculation, but 
those efforts are ongoing. Region 7, uh, the province is broken up into seven regions. We're Region 7. We're made up of the six municipalities in Yarmouth and Digby County. We're the smallest, but the mightiest of the regions. Heavily involved in education, awareness, and compliance programs. Uh, we're very fond of our, our My Waste app. It's graining popularity. Uh, I think everywhere in Nova Scotia has this app now, but it's good to remember that Waste Check were the first ones in Nova Scotia to have this. Uh, we've got about 1,500 users now. 24% uh, of those are here in the town of Yarmouth. And we're averaging about 25 new downloads a month. So we're almost up to a download a day. So it's going the right way. That having been said, folks still like to use the telephone around here. So we average about 3,000 calls a year to our hotline. One of the things that's significant is when these programs started, most of the calls were what we call, where does that go, calls. People calling to ask where something goes. But you can see that small slice of the pie there. That's the uh, where does it go calls now. So people have learned a few things about how the program's supposed to work over the last 20 years. The main calls we get now are about uh, questions about collection or uh, about green cards. We do a lot of community outreach, event greening, festivals. Uh, we like to do parades with Mr. Greenbin. Of course, we do business and curbside visits as well. I don't know why they chose that picture. It's all good. <laughs> uh, we do uh, other community outreach as well, holler appreciation days, and we organize special events for Earth Day, Compost Awareness Week, Environment Week, and Waste Reduction Week. We also work with our quick service businesses in the town, uh, not just with their sorting, but we also help them do customized signage for their stores. Uh, we make signs taking pictures of their actual products, so when the customer is standing there with their tray, what's on their tray is right there on the sign in front of them. We find that's quite effective as well. Uh, we're involved in litter cleanups year-round, but never more so than during your Adopt-a-Block. And we've been a long-time member of Communities in Bloom. We're also responsible for the uh, delivery and repair of green carts. It's uh, worth noting that a lot of our carts now, the original ones that were rolled out, are 18 years old. Uh, they're uh, warranty lifespan is 10 years old, so uh, repairing and replacing these carts is becoming a bigger and bigger issue as time goes on. Uh, the picture on the bottom is a new style of cart we're using or trying now. Uh, it's different from the old one in that it doesn't have any vents in it. Uh, the old ones we discovered, the vents were really uh, made it easy for rodents and other critters to get into the carts. Okay. The other thing is this one has a round bottom, which makes it really resistant to chewing by the rodents. And the other advantage of the round bottom is with the old square bottom ones, when things froze in there the winter, they were frozen, they're good. Uh, with these round bottoms, they tend to, even if the waste freezes, it tends to pop out like an ice cube, uh, out of an ice cube tray. So, so far, the new carts are working out quite well. And of course, we put a lot of effort into reminding people what they can and cannot put into their green carts. Uh, this is of particular importance to you guys since you own the compost plant. Uh, we struggle still against the biodegradable plastic bags. That's going to be ongoing. Uh, we're involved in uh, enforcement and compliance. We have a full-time bylaw officer who, of course, works with Russell at the, at the town. So waste disposal, the Canadian average is still 720 kilograms per person per year. Uh, the provincial average here is 404 kilograms per person. That's for every man, woman, and child. And in our region, we're at 354 kilograms. So we're doing good, but we're still a ways from that provincial target of 300 kilograms. Um, on the sad side of things is that uh, if you look at, uh, compare our cost per ton to manage material and you look at some of the other jurisdictions across Canada, you find out that we have the highest costs in, in Canada on a per ton basis. Uh, we have a system that's very effective and is the envy of a lot of places, uh, but it's quite expensive to run. Province-wide, just, just because of the way things are mandated in the province. Uh, which brings us to a conversation about the viability of the provincial system as it is right now. Um, less than, well, typically 6% of the, uh, the costs of providing these services across the board is, comes from uh, Divert Nova Scotia. They used to be RFB, but that's the people who administer the deposit refund on pop beverage containers. Uh, so they only provide 6% of the cost, and remaining 94% of the cost either comes from tipping fees at the facilities or the bulk of it comes from municipal tax dollars, and that's, that's the reality of the situation. Uh, so that's a good time to remember that you're part of a bigger picture. Uh, we are just one region. Uh, every one of those regions has at least one regional coordinator. They work very closely with Divert Nova Scotia and with Nova Scotia Environment on messaging and, and programs. Uh, there's a managers and directors group that uh, is really just for facility operators for the most part, and it's really just a technical day-to-day uh, -day operation sharing, information sharing type of group. 
And then there's the regional chairs. As I mentioned, there's seven waste management regions. Each one of those has uh, an elected municipal politician as their chair. And those regional chairs meet on a, region, on a regular basis, sorry, probably every six to eight weeks. And they sort of act as the, uh, the main flow or main conduit between our municipal units and our provincial government on matters of solid waste. And there's a fourth group called the Priorities Group. This is a group that's technically a subcommittee of regional chairs, uh, but it's made up of two of those elected politicians, two of the regional coordinators, two representatives from managers and directors, uh, the UNSM, uh, uh, NSE, Divert, and Municipal Affairs. And one of the main things that they've been charged with is the provincial efficiency study that has recently gotten underway. Uh, back in 2016, the Environment Minister, which was Margaret Miller at that time, uh, we were asking for extended producer responsibility. And uh, the Minister wanted us to do a study to see if we could make our, our systems more efficient without, doing, uh, without making the step to uh, extended producer responsibility. So the Priorities Committee has been overseeing that. The $150,000 project, uh, which is being funded by DIVERT, has been awarded to ACOM. Uh, which they have offices across Canada, and the project's going to be managed by Ray Rice out of their Halifax office. ACOM brings a lot of experience to the table. They were very much a key developer of the National Solid Waste Benchmarking Initiative, so they know quite a bit about solid waste. Mr. Guzhu. Yeah. Just curious, uh, Gus, the, the province is leading that study uh, 20 years into, you know, the source separation program, what mm -hmm. have you. What, is, what, what do you think the intention is? Like, so they get a report from a consultant that says it should be done differently. All of the assets that are currently in the system are owned by individual or small groups of municipalities. Any sense of what they're going to do with that when it comes back and says well, do something different? There, there's certainly anecdotal evidence to suggest that it will uh, join a lot of other reports on shelves, and we, but we certainly hope that's not going to be the case. Um, Honestly, um, I, I don't think this is a study that's needed, but the, uh, the environment minister and the current minister, uh, Ian Rankin, has reaffirmed that they want this study done before they will entertain any conversation about extended producer responsibility. Uh, so if they want it done, we're going to have it done. It's as simple as that. Um, I think it's safe to say that uh, no one's going to be happy with the outcome of the study because it's going to suggest that a lot of smaller facilities are inefficient. Uh, in the big scheme of things and because the volume of waste they're dealing with is so low. Um, so there's going to be probably a lot of unhappy people with what the study has to say, but the minister wants it done and it's going to be done. Okay. So if, uh, thank you, Worship, just one follow-up is just, and Councillor Hood were, would remember this uh, perhaps better than anybody else at the table. When this, when this source separation program was rolled out in the province, uh, the province allowed municipalities to figure it out, right? I say allowed generously. Um, <laughs> and, and there were mis mistakes made. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, it will be no surprise when it comes back and says it could be done better, but it's, it's a couple decades late, really, to be doing that kind of work in, in a sense when we've invested millions of dollars. But, you know, it is what it is, right? It is indeed. And I think it's worth pointing out that at the time when uh, these, some of the decisions were being made, municipalities weren't necessarily forecasting how expensive the system would get in the future. And some decisions were probably made about very valid concerns about creating jobs locally, uh, which you know we, we need, but are not necessarily, when you look at them through a big lens, efficient. Uh, what we do want is we want extended producer responsibility, uh, which of course is just a complete paradigm shift where the people who put products into the marketplace are responsible for their uh, end of life. Yes. Yeah. No, Cliff, Cliff has light on. Oh, I'm Jeff. terribly sorry, Mr. Jeff, no, it's my, Jeff wanted to uh, preempt him. <laughs> well, I'll just pick up for a minute on what Jeff said. Originally, uh, the concept was that um, each region would be responsible for everything, everything that went on in the region, and that's been bled away. And, you know, they're shipping stuff out of regions to other places because they can get a competitive or cheaper advantage. But the idea was, I think you're right, that two things. One, it would help uh, retain employment in the local regions, but I don't think that was the primary thing. I think it was a responsibility aspect. I think that we should be responsible, each one of us, for the cost of disposing of our waste. I think that was the 
concept and you needed to have a reasonable approach to give it some efficiency within the regions though it created competition for jobs and friction however we won that battle to some extent here well, I think it's also fair to, you made, to say that you made some smart decisions. You know, I don't when, want to be pejorative on that, but here's a, here's a question I had, Your Worship. Uh, you mentioned at the outset of your uh, presentation the issue of the uh, industrial, what do you call it, the, uh, when you tear down the cotton mill type of Construction place. demolition. Yeah. And uh, the funding that you get from the... Uh, Resource Recovery Board, or what's it called now? They're called Divert Nova Scotia. Yeah, Divert now. Nova Scotia. Um, how was that impacted when there's a large uh, disposal of ice? What the hell is it called? I should know. C and D, construction and demolition. Yeah, C and D, like like the like the uh, cotton mill. How does that impact your funding? It has a very significant impact on our funding in the... And, uh, and how is that? Um, a big part of the funding is what they call diversion credit funding, which is a misleading name because it's actually based on how much you dispose of, not how much you divert. Um, typically in, in our region, we uh, get credit for uh, diverting about 12,000 tons a year. The way they come up with that calculation is back in 1989, everybody made a commitment they were going to reduce waste by 50% by the year 2000. So what they do is they compare your actual waste right now to what they think you would have thrown away in 1989. They subtract the two and the difference is how much you've diverted. So for us, typically we get credit for diverting about 12,000 metric tons. Uh, a project, the scope of the, uh, uh, the cotton mill uh, was almost 8,500 metric tons of waste. So it was essentially gonna wipe out most of our diversion credit funding for the next fiscal year. And what's um, the dollar value of that? Uh, we were we were anticipating it was going to be about 140 or 150 thousand dollar loss to out of your budget of a half a million dollars. Yes, sir. Okay, something we're going to have to look at at some point. Thank and you. it's a, it's a, a serious concern for other issues too. Cape Breton or CBRM is struggling with this because they have a huge number of derelict homes, particularly in the Glace Bay area, old uh, company homes. Uh, that are going to have to come down, and when that happens, it's going to significantly impact Literally their funding. hundreds of them they have to tear down. Yeah. Good. That's all I have, Your Worship. Thank you. Okay. Oh, I got some questions here. Go ahead, Deputy, oh. and then. Plus, Gus. Sorry, Councilor Mooney. <laughs> and and <laughs> Councilor Hood touched on it, uh, especially with the way the province is handling the passing on of old schools and, and school properties. Wouldn't that be. Wouldn't uh, those special projects like the demolition of the cotton mill or the demolition of a Milton school or the demolition of another large property that was maybe a school board property, wouldn't like, isn't that a, an exception to, shouldn't it be like regular, like we had the 12 ton limit you said, or the 12 ton baseline, mm -hmm. wouldn't something extraordinary like a school or a project of that magnitude Shouldn't that be taken out of the equation or in, uh, in, I, the, in the real world? I, I agree with you. It absolutely should, but it is not. Uh, there's even an example where one area lost all of their funding one year because TIR took down a overpass and buried it, and that wiped out their diversion for the year. So um, there's certainly lots of uh, examples of why there should be exceptions for these things, but as of yet, there are not. Uh, the main reason we can't, well, my own personal opinion, sorry, of why we can't get any motion from the province on this is because Halifax Regional Municipality is against any change to this diversion formula. They have um, bylaws that they only have two construction demolition sites within their boundaries, and they have a bylaw that requires them to divert 70% of the material that comes across the scale. Now, it's worth noting that most of that diversion is means it's used as landfill cover. So if you have a huge landfill, it's pretty easy to turn 70% of your C&D waste into landfill cover and call it diverted. But HRM is the only one really in that position to do that. Uh, but as long as they have half the population and they're opposed to any change in the formula, we're fighting an uphill battle. To that point, Governor Mayor, I think you said in your presentation that you've been lobbying to have C&D just generally taken out of <coughs> the diversion credit system. <coughs> And yes. that would be the, rather than piecemealing it and everybody trying to 
get their school in or that it would be better if the, the lobby or the, the request to the province would be to take C and D disposal right out altogether. Absolutely, it'd be much fairer because what we're really trying to do is measure the effectiveness of our composting and recycling programs. And the data is being completely skewed if you put in all these you know, buildings, some case built 200 years ago that now have to come down. Uh, but it appears to be taking away from the hard work of your citizens now to participate in your programs. But we will continue to, to fight the fight. We're just not having a lot of progress thus far. So is it the Department of Environment that ultimately makes Yes. So that's the problem. That's <laughs> waiting for him to say that. That's the problem. So, so just, Jim, you're going to be on in one second because you had your light on. I forgot what I was going to say. So, um, so like a lot of things that are going on, we talk about them and we say this is what we wish, but has there been a really concerted effort of the municipality sitting down and saying, you know what, enough. So really, that whole TIR thing, you fill up my, and then, so I lose? Na 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 na? Is that what happens? Right? Pretty so, much. So. So I don't think that um, I understand HRM, and I under you know they have to protect their, but there's the rest of us, the rest of the province as well. So I'm not sure, and I I'm just guessing. I'm I'm not sure there's been a concerted effort where the municipalities have this on their radar to such an extent that we bring it to UNSM and say we're like this is ridiculous. Since I've been at Waste Check, there have been two concerted efforts, but I would say we're building up to our third attempt here now, and that's why I keep bringing it up with the councils and I get the chance. I think we have to try and put some pressure on the provincial government yeah. to recognize that, you know, this, this is a significant problem. It is. You know, there are a lot of regions where there will be one municipally owned uh, construction demolition site, and they may make, you know, millions of dollars a year in, in revenue off that site. It, there's no economic sense for them to turn that away so that the region as a whole can get a couple hundred thousand dollars in funding. You know, yeah. it just doesn't make sense. The exactly. Halifax example is, is a case unto itself. It, it shouldn't impact the rest of the province. No, it shouldn't. But. Exactly. Jim? You're good, Jim. <clears throat> Gosh, thank, thanks very much. I have fun being an observer at your meetings. <laughs> <laughs> well, we like having you. <laughs> um, have you noticed that uh, I've on television, CBC television, there's a program, Reduce, Reuse, and Rethink. It's a new, it's, they just started the last two or three days. And it's, uh, when you look at Toronto or Ontario or, or Ottawa, it's huge, the, the waste that they're trying to manage. And uh, I just wanted to make you aware of that, because it's, 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 it's a regular feature now on, on CBC television. Excellent, we'll have so, to check that out. Yeah, Reduce, Reuse, and Rethink. Thank you. Good staff. So you right. good? Can I go back? <laughs> Can you go back? Can I finish my presentation or my? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were finished. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm, well, I'm sorry, trying to get there, took, Mayor. I swear. Well, well, I'm sorry, Gus, but we took all your time. <laughs> well, that's within your prerogative to do, Mayor. <laughs> go ahead. Anyway, we were speaking uh, about extended producer responsibility. I just wanted to point out that 80% of the population of Canada already lives in jurisdictions where they have extended producer responsibility. It's really just Alberta and Atlantic Canada that are not participating in these programs. Uh, and the irksome thing about it is that these fees that are built into products uh, on an individual unit basis are very small. I mean, my favorite example is the craft dinner box. The, the, the fee that the manufacturer pays is one one hundredth of a cent per box. Uh, but these programs across Canada returned over $360 million to Canadian municipalities last year to help pay for their, their blue bag pro programs. Um, Nova Scotia got none of that money, but it seems very reasonable that you're paying those same fees. I don't think that box of KD gets marked down one one hundredth of a cent when it comes to Nova Scotia because we don't have extended producer responsibility. Uh, and the province, uh, their own Department of Envir Environment calculates that it would be worth somewhere in the ballpark of 15 to 20 million dollars a year, money that would go directly to Nova Scotia municipalities if we enacted uh, extended producer responsibility like 80% of Canada already has. Won't talk about plastic film, you guys already talked about that and I'm running out of time. Finally, budget information, typically our budget's about a half million dollars a year. Um, the main uh, chunk of that comes through to divert Nova Scotia uh, programs. 
Uh, this year, our ask for 1819 is a municipal contribution of a total of 117,500, uh, which for the town of Yarmouth is $18,126. I have a meeting coming up next week with the CAOs to review the budget. Just for information purposes, Gus, what's your formula for breaking down the 117.5 among the municipalities? It's based on a, uh, a formula of 50% population and 50% uniform assessment. So it's, we think it's fairly fair. It's very fair. Absolutely. Actually. Are there any questions left? <laughs> no, but that should, uh, that should be how everything's broken down. No, I, I have no questions. Anybody else have any questions for Gus? Good stuff. Well, uh, thank you very much. It's always very so much fun to come to your council meeting. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> You're joking, right? <laughs> Fire! <laughs> Welcome, Chief. I don't know, Linda, if my report was handed out in hard copy, was it? Or, or was it on? It is hard copy? Okay, good. Yeah, we've, I think we've got it. Okay, so I don't need this then, so. Yeah, we got it. Close, close that for now and it's okay like <coughs> just in case it doesn't work again <laughs> okay uh, thanks for giving me some time there's just a few things I wanted to uh, to go over to the budget just to, to give you an idea of what happened last year first of all in a couple of the accounts and what we're looking at this year um, last year 2017-18 uh, in the budget there was a uh, over cost uh, in one of the line items and vehicle maintenance of uh, a lot of money, right? And uh, that was due to a couple of uh, uh, issues. First of all, truck 11, the ladder, the costs for that and repairs were over 10,000 because we had, a, uh, way over 10,000, because we had to send it to uh, Moncton for repairs for the hydraulics, the stabilizers and the waterway issues. Uh, it was not actually safe because it wasn't, it wasn't raising fluently and it wasn't coming down fluently, it was actually bobbing up and down and anybody inside the bucket would have been flying out right so <laughs> we can't do that we had to fix it uh, the you other notice, cost you notice we're not blinking an eye try being a transit bus yeah 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 there's uh it, it's it's vehicle costs these days especially after what happened over the Man, last couple of years in the crazy. fire service is going to be bad yeah real bad um, engine two there was a, a number of costs there for repairs we had to send it to Moncton also for a uh, part for a pump and uh, also repairs um, like these types of things I just wanted to say why it went over last year is, is because they're, you can't predict them uh, they happen in large vehicles especially when the vehicles get older especially the heavy units not the light units um, and and I just wanted to mention that just so everybody understands now to cover that what we did in in uh, in all the other line items is what we did was we tried to scrimp and save everywhere so where you see that there's a bit of money left over in, a, in an account it's there specifically because we were trying to save to cover those costs right um, the other one was uh, uh, fire station repairs um, I find it difficult to get repairs done in the fire department and over the last little while there's been some issues with uh, some of the uh, one of the man doors mainly and one of the big bay doors out back at the station and the leftover money in that account was supposed to be earmarked for it and I still haven't been able to get it fixed because we can't get someone to come in to get to fix it so I just wanted to bring that to your attention from last year okay um, yeah. and that's why it's like that uh, the operations for this year there's uh, a few things that are really going to affect it the training costs for new members is, is sitting at around uh, eighteen hundred dollars that's just for one member for one firefighter so you get a firefighter off the street or a person off the street and you want to turn them into a firefighter it's going to cost a minimum of eighteen hundred dollars and and that's that's for volunteer right um, also the uh, kidding out the new members when they come in it's it's around uh, fifty six hundred dollars for every every new member we get and that's even if they are trained so if you get a person off the street who's not trained and who also needs kit you're, you're looking at a fair amount of money there for one firefighter um, I did a quick assessment when I first got here about how many firefighters we needed how many uh, tra well trained volunteers we would need and it sat at around 60 to get the proper appropriate amount of people on scene to fight a fire um, and sitting at around 60 right now, we went up for the first couple of years when we were doing our new recruitment program, and now we've come right back down because the demographics, of course, everybody's older and they can't stick around as long. And so now we're starting to go back down in numbers again. And to pick that back up, it, it's gonna cost a lot of money again. So, so go ahead. I so what we're thinking about doing is, is and what we are gonna do is, is we're not going to uh, have a program this year, an actual 
course that we've been putting on for the last three years. We're going to actually uh, try an uh, on-the-job training type of program where the person comes in, if they're already trained, they'll take a couple of modules of training and then they'll get them their training that way. That'll save us some money and also a person right off the street who isn't a firefighter at the moment. We, we need a way of training them and we're going to try this. Now, it's not in place right now, uh, but it's I think it's the best way for us to go because the amount of money, if we get a 10-person course, 10 times whatever you see there, just starting off to get them without, That's like to get them trained and kitted up, it, this is getting crazy. So right? what's, what's in the, I have to ask this very quickly, what, what's in the kit? Because I'm looking at this three times as much to make them look good as it is to train yeah, them. Uh, yeah, the bunker <laughs> gear is the main thing. The yeah. when, when you put when you buy bunker gear, you're looking at around three thousand dollars. That's what it is. Yeah. Oh yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, they have to be uh, NFPA approved. Uh, they have right to be on. to keep them safe, right? When okay. you're doing proximity firefighting, you got to have uh, the proper That's equipment. A big number. Right? Okay, so there's there, there's there's the big issues there for the rest of all the things you see below it. Uh, another one I'm going to be very quickly here. If you have questions, go ahead and ask. Um, an increase. Some of the increases you're going to see, and one of them down at the bottom of the page. Uh, for firefighting equipment and maintenance is the BA bottles. Uh, we're, we still have a steel BA bottles that's been around for uh, a long, long time, and we, we, we need to get them changed out. And there's a couple of ways we thought about doing to be able to do that. One of them is to uh, get the increase in the operational budget up to 16 from 6, which is a big increase. It's over 100%. Um, uh, and then we would replace the bottles on a cycle uh, over the next 10 or 12 years to be able to have them all changed out and then continue that on uh, with the new type of bottles, right? Or uh, maybe next year, the year after, turning it into a, a capital project and getting 20 bottles at a time, or yeah, 20 bottles in six year cycles to, to, to replace them all. Uh, there's two different ways you could do it. Um, it needs to be done. These bottles are old, they're the heaviest bottles you can. Uh, you, I don't know if you've ever lifted one, but lift the new bottles, you can do it with one hand, lift the old bottles, you need both, right? Um, that's how heavy they are. Uh, so th those two big things on the first sheet is what I wanted to bring to your attention. Um, the other thing is, is the training, going back to the training, is our, um, our volunteers at, the, at this time, the ones that do all the extra training and all the extra work to become certified to train other firefighters, especially in the courses we've had, are taking a lot of time and effort out of their own uh, family time and off work and stuff to go to courses and get it. So you see an increase there uh, in that GL for firefighter training uh, by uh, 5,000. I had to lean back, my glasses aren't working great. So that, that increase there would be used for an honorarium type of system to, to get them to be more interested and to give them something back for all their extra time. Uh, right now, a volunteer will come in on every Tuesday night to give the training, right? Uh, with the new, other new volunteers, right? And, and basically they're not getting anything out of the current honorarium for that. Um, and then um, the other one is for the public uh, fire prevention, public education. Over the last couple of years, a couple of things have happened. Uh, one of them is, uh, again, uh, the uh, uh, costs for uh, legal started coming out of it. I think it was last year, Jeff would know better. I think, it, I can't remember out of Dave's budget for fire prevention, the, the legal costs started coming out somewhere at one point. So we're trying to cover that off. Uh, also, an honorarium again for all the fire prevention guys you see every year. Uh, you see them at the malls, you see them out at uh, public events, you see them going to schools, you see them, like all that kind of stuff was just being done and wasn't being covered by the current honorarium system. Um, and of course, Sparky, uh, <laughs> Sparky suits are very expensive, <laughs> and uh, our Sparky is is not too healthy. We had to take him to the vet a few times over the last year, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, so we're we're hoping we can help him out by getting uh, another Sparky so he doesn't have to work anymore because he's old. Um, uh, so that's one of the areas there that. Uh, <laughs> well, we can get Jim to do it next year. Yeah. Um, Basically, uh, also, uh, I got to go back to the maintenance ones. There's one thing I forgot about: the province mandated uh, every two years for uh, hub inspections on all the heavy units. So every two years uh, from now until the end of time, we're going to have to pull all the wheels and the hubs off all the uh, heavy units and get them inspected. And anything that needs fixing has to be fixed. And that's why there's also an increase in that budget. Uh, I think the fire vehicles going from uh, 
30,000 to 30 surgeries and $7,000 increase there, and that's why. So. Good. Is there any questions? Good. Many questions for the chief? So I get to have all that stuff, money I asked for? <laughs> Your wish is our command, <laughs> Jerry. <laughs> Thanks, Chief. <laughs> Poor Jerry doesn't know what to do. Jerry treats everybody the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, you're right. Jerry doesn't know what to do. Miss Natalie. It gets tired waiting around, doesn't it? A low cycle, I need some sugar. Good oh, afternoon. there's cookies back there. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so I'm just presenting uh, special projects that Pro Economic Development is looking to carry out this coming fiscal year. Uh, broken them down into four categories. One is the Arts and Culture Center project, phases one and two. Uh, the continuation of the facade program, uh, some branding, signage work for the transit system, and um, the town accessibility plan. So I just wanted to maybe highlight, uh, I know most of you probably understand this, but I thought it would be a good refresher. Uh, so we've identified the arts and culture project into really four phases, uh, visioning, feasibility, fundraising, tendering, and construction. So today we're in phase one, which is the feasibility uh, portion of the project. And uh, the budget uh, reflects that phase. This is just a little Gantt chart schedule to show you the work that has been completed and the work that is yet to be completed. So uh, if Everything aligns, we should complete it, be completed phase one uh, in May. The budget related to that scope of work, uh, some of it had started in the previous fiscal year, uh, which we're in right now, and the balance of it is to be completed in the early part of the new fiscal year. So uh, the budget submission uh, it, for the project for phase one is $116,900 plus HST. Uh, that consists of the feasibility study and concept design that we're currently doing. Uh, in the new budget, it's uh, 68200 that we have yet, we would have yet to, um, spend. to use up, spend, thank you. Uh, the board governance frame model work, we're, we've already launched that. <coughs> Uh, and in 20, the 2018 budget, we would have to uh, spend another $18,700. The economic impact study I've just identified there as uh, a placeholder uh, at 30,000 plus HST. We're currently just uh, getting multiple quotes on that scope of work, so we have something to review against what we already have. Uh, the phase two, I just again put a placeholder uh, and this is for the fundraising portion, uh, developing the marketing collateral, and if we have to outsource any expertise in that area, uh, I've just identified a budget of $65,000. So the total request or submission is for $181,900. The facade program, um, the Facade Society in last month's Committee of the Whole did a good presentation of uh, what the ask was, so I just wanted to refresh you again on the program achievements that reflect the budget. Um, in the previous three fiscal years, uh, the town has contributed uh, $275,000 to the program, so I've just identified what that looks like. And in the coming fiscal year, the request is for 140000 and that would be inclusive of any expenses, insurance, and just, re just uh, updating with the registry of joint stock. And then uh, we allocate a, um, a portion of that for facade renderings. I think we, what do we refer to budget? 150, I think. 140. 140. 
140 we allocated to budget? Or are we referred? Okay, good. Uh, the branding program, so uh, in the last fiscal year, uh, we completed the overall way the wayfinding signage program. We did do some initial transit signage. So this is the signage that would really identify the route, the times. What we've identified here uh, to help us along with our accessibility plan in the future is uh, to identify how the information for visually impaired. So there would be Braille as well as uh, the font size. Again, high contrast. So uh, I've put a placeholder amount of $18,000 just to complete uh, the pole design. Uh, when we originally installed the bus signage, we just identified locations, and so there's a mix and match of, of uh, different poles. So this is just thinking ahead and again putting a placeholder. Uh, as you know, the province um, last year, April 2017, uh, brought about the Accessibility Act, of which by 2030, 2030 they're hoping that all public, um, the pub pu public sector body as well as businesses will achieve the requirements. Uh, so one of the things that will be asked by the municipalities is that we were we are to submit an accessibility plan of how we're going to achieve those goals. And so I've put in a placeholder of $28,000 uh, for the creation of an accessibility plan. So the total budget submission for special projects, uh, when you take those four items, uh, is $367,900. Thank you. Any questions for Natalie? This is all great stuff. Great. Jerry, Jerry only sort of likes it. I'm sorry? <laughs> Jerry only sort of likes it. <laughs> we chat. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. Good stuff. All righty. Thanks, Natalie. <clears throat> okay, Jerry. I guess you're up. I really don't have you're up all day tomorrow. I'm up all day tomorrow. We'll chat then. Okay. Frank. Okay. I'll be seven minutes. <laughs> Thanks for... Uh, allow me seven to ten minutes to talk about recreation. I could talk longer, but for the sake of time, we'll keep right on going. Uh, first off, I want to thank the, uh, the town councillors uh, and town citizens that make up our Recreation Advisory Committee. Uh, our chairman is uh, Deputy Mayor Phil Mooney, and we also have Councillor Cleveland and Councillor Barry as representatives on, on our committee, as well as our town citizens, Neil McKenzie, Del Boudreau and Kevin Northup. Uh, first off, I just wanted to mention a little bit about what we do, and that really is a little bit of what we do. Um, some of the, as far as uh, recreation programs and services that we offer for both town and municipal residents. Um, one of the things I've been doing since uh, I came to Yarmouth is. Uh, we changed a lot of the programming that we do and we try to fill in the gaps that are missing and we try as much as possible to work with the community to su help support them. So uh, obviously our summer time is the bus busiest time for our, our activities where we have approximately 25 seasonal staff on board uh, leading programs and activities but when we shift into the fall and winter we still have uh, uh, supervisors in schools that open up schools for, for various activities, as well as we have a number of uh, program staff available leading all of these types of things from day camps to workshops to paddling to Canada Day to Christmas tree lighting to bike again to drop-in fun nights and more. 
uh, facilities. Uh, John Darcy is our facilities coordinator and we're always working hard at main maintaining our facilities that we have. And I put a list together there for you that we have uh, all the, the fields at uh, Broadbrook Recreation Park, Gateway Park with the uh, not only two ball fields but also the track facilities that are there. Uh, tennis courts, uh, the most recent facility is the play on ball hockey arena, um, ball fields and soccer pitches, uh, Lake Milo Aquatic Club, the Hebron Recreation Co Complex, uh, two trails at the, uh, the Forshoe River Trail at the Hebron Complex, and the Tickpock Trail at Arcadia School. Uh, we've got green gym equipment spread out between uh, Coronation Park and the Hebron Complex. Um, and we have two halls that we rent out and are very busy at the Lake Milo Boat Club and the Rotary Centre. Um, another another uh, aspect that some of you may or may not know is... Frank, what's the process for getting a facility put on that list? Okay. The process for putting a facility on that list? Right, go back, go back a slide. <coughs> Two slides, I guess. Oh. Right, so this is the facilities, parks and facilities uh, that you operate and or provide services, I guess, throughout the year. Is that the complete list? That should be the complete list that we <clears throat> mow, maintain. Right, and so if there were, like I see Overton Ball Field is on there, that doesn't belong to the town or municipality and the the trail in Arcadia, well, probably does belong to the municipality now. Um, what, uh, what is the process to get a facility put on that list? Is there a process? So use, a good example is the Overton Ball Field. The Overton Ball Field is owned by a private society, um, and they approached us to work out a maintenance agreement for them to open up that field for use for their co-ed slow pitch league. And we have had a few other uses. Minor Ball has used it periodically, but not, not at a regular use. So um, they approached us to, uh, to maintain it, basically mow it, um, uh, drag it, get it ready for, for play. So we just- Do they pay you for that? They, they do pay us for that. We charge the same as our normal fields. What do you mean? So we- we charge the co-ed league. Uh, oh no, no! I mean, I mean the the over the owners of the Overton Field. They don't pay you. The owners do not pay us. No, we when we took it over, we needed another field, and we saw that as an opportunity. And um, it's a good question because right now we're looking at uh, between the uh, Lady Jays uh, girls softball program and minor baseball, they've expressed interest for another diamond or two. And um, we have talked about our, possibly Arcadia School being uh, revived back into a ball diamond, or uh, we've even mentioned Pembroke Field to revive that. Um, we're looking more at, as far as scheduling, trying to open up some fields with our schedule and possibly night, night play. But um, no, Overton, we probably probably maintain that field for that society for at least 10 years. Right. So, so we've taken over some recreation facilities at uh, South Centennial School. As an example, when the school was turned back to us, if we wanted you to take those facilities on, uh, is that a letter or how do we do that? That would be a, just a who conversation and, and we, can, we can explore that. Who, who decides? Uh, pardon me? Who decides? Uh, we, it would be something that we would bring to our committee, but what, what facilities in particular are we looking at? Well, there's a, there's a hard court back there that was developed years ago for ball hockey and that sort of thing. I'm uh, thinking about at Central School, which is likely to turn, be turned back to us in the not too distant future with the basketball courts, and you know, we know we've had to put some money into those. And just wondering if there's a, what the process is and, and how it's decided whether a facility becomes under your, under your, on, on your facility list to be managed or not, how that happens. Well, uh, it would start right now. So, because I'm, I'm interested, um, that, would that include space in the actual building as well? Uh, not necessarily. 
I'm thinking about the outdoor outdoor facilities at this point, but anything's possible. Okay, we'll be talking. Okay. Um, so one of the things that I was going to mention about, was about the various grant opportunities that we have. Even though they are small, we do help numerous recreation groups uh, with their activities that they do uh, through a small grant program. It's roughly $4,000 a year with a maximum of $400 uh, per activity. Uh, we do have an elite athlete grant that we try our best to support uh, children and youth that are playing at a higher level with uh, goals and aims to continue playing at a high level, whether that be provincial teams or higher. And we have uh, jumpstart and kid sport programs that help those that need uh, assistance with equipment or registration fees. Um, do you work with uh, or talk to the J Strong people at all? All the time. Okay. It's so I'm just wondering if we oversubscribe the, uh, the the grant opportunities to the elite athletes and the Jumpstart and Kid Start programs. Do we use that up every year? Is that like you oversubscribed or you get it to the? The the uh, Jumpstart and Kid Sport programs are not within our pot of municipal funds. Yeah. Those are Canadian Tire Jumpstart and. Uh, through uh, Sport Nova Scotia for Kids Sport. Um, the, the relationship that we have with Jay Strong is that when they get applications or we get applications, it's a conversation between Steve Barry and myself to make sure that we're not overlapping, overlapping applications. Yeah, okay, exactly. Um, and just a note about the uh, volunteers and community groups that we work with. Um, out of the list of all the programs that we do, um, we may be involved with an activity. It may not be an activity of Yarmouth Recreation, but I may be there or one of our staff may be there helping with, with various uh, components of the different things that happen in the community. And one of the great committees that we have uh, is our work that we do in Yarmouth and Shelburne counties as far as recreation. Uh, and we share a lot of uh, types of opportunities. For example, uh, the sledges that that have been purchased is, has, have been purchased as Yarmouth and Shelburne counties. So we share that equipment and we're able to offer uh, activities at arenas in Yarmouth and Shelburne County and as well as in Clare and Digby because we have shared our equipment with those folks as well. Um, I mentioned uh, strengthening school partnerships that we have community use in four schools at present and uh, very excited that when the new Yarmouth Elementary School uh, opens, we will be looking at opportunities for community use at the gym that was the former uh, junior high gym. So really looking forward to that. And marketing and promotions. Uh, Misty James with our department is the main person with our uh, South Shore Connect uh, website and Facebook. Uh, pages and uh, if you visited our, our Facebook page you can see the traffic that we're getting and it's uh, I can I can honestly say that the traffic and the amount of hits that we're getting every it seems to be growing and growing and growing every every day so the reason that I'm here today is to present some numbers for budget uh, I'm not going to go line by line um, you can have a peek there and uh, what I did was I, I put the uh, budget from the previous year is in the first column and the proposed budget that has been submitted to uh, the finance department and to you folks uh, for consideration is in the second column. And uh, basically how it works is um, once we look at our expected revenue sources for the year and, and uh, our expenses, whatever the net between the expenses and the revenue, whatever that comes out to, you take that amount and divide it by two, and the municipality and the town pay 50% of our budget. So last year, based on this formula, uh, the town had paid $311,000 for recreation. This year, we're asking for a little bit more. Uh, we're asking for $331,000. And I guess I'll go on. Um, I guess really the, the difference is um, last year when we, we did face a cut and the area that we cut it was in our capital projects um, budget line. 
And Frank, yeah. I think uh, if I'm correct and you can't correct me, um, or Councillor Barry or Councillor Cleveland, the last uh, Leisure Service Committee we had, I think the, we placed a quite an importance on the work at the Milo Boat Club. Yeah. Um, yes. That, and, and maybe you can just tell the rest of council uh, the amount of uh, activity that's, I was quite surprised, the amount of activity that's generated at the boat club, not only during the summer, but during the fall, winter, and spring too. So well, uh, I think we were really, really interested in, uh, uh, especially with new, some of the new accessibility things that are coming through, uh, both the washrooms and some of the other things in the building. Exactly, and you know, we usually have a capital pro project budget of $50,000 per year, and that's not a whole lot of money, but most of the time we can leverage some of that funds with some provincial grants as well to make that $50,000 uh, pot of money go a bit further. Um, and as you mentioned, it seems like out of all the projects that we've identified, uh, there's quite a few projects that are uh, at Lake Milo where we do have heavy traffic in the summertime. We have lifeguarding uh, services there in the summer. It's a hot spot for swimming, uh, canoe kayaking, uh, lessons take place. Um, we have uh, canoe and kayak rentals. Uh, we have dragon boating nights. And on top of that, we have the hall upstairs that's booked for aerobics, for tai chi, for ballroom dancing, for birthday parties and showers. So at present, um, Lake Milo is in need of a facelift. Um, it's been about 10 years since we've done an exterior work on, on, the, uh, on the boat club. So we're looking at that as one of our, our identified projects. And um, another big one is the hardwood floor upstairs. It needs to be replaced. Um, we've refinished it a few times over the past few years, but we're down to the nails. So uh, we're looking at a, a total floor replacement there at the, uh, at the Milo, at the Milo uh, banquet room. Uh, and then the other big project as part of Milo is our washrooms. Um, if you've been in there, um, the washrooms have not been renovated probably since it was reopened. There might have been some paint or a, a new toilet or sink put in, but really, uh, the washrooms are in, in need of a renovation. And as Natalie mentioned previously, with the, uh, with the regulations that, are, that we're facing in you know, 12 years, um, we're gonna be looking at trying to make those, uh, those facilities accessible. Um, and one of the reasons that uh, some of our seniors' activities have moved away from Milo is because of the accessibility factor to get up the stairs physically into the banquet room. So in order for us to address that, we were thinking of a chairlift, and um, it would require some structural changes to the building to, to have a chairlift and a landing at the top of the stairs uh, big enough to, to accommodate someone in a chairlift. So there's a number of projects right there that um, would consume our, our $50,000. Obviously, the, the things that we're thinking of wouldn't happen in one year, but we'd like to pick away at three or four projects per year, access some provincial funding, and uh, try to get things going. Uh, the other things on my list, um, we're, we're looking at, uh, over time, uh, replacing our bleachers at all of our sports fields. Um, we've found some um, reasonably pr priced aluminum bleachers that we have already, we probably have five or six sets of them. Um, we're, we're still using the bleachers that are, uh, I call them the exhibition bleachers, um, but they're getting to the point where the structure, the metal structure is, is uh, getting to the point where we can't weld them anymore. So we're slowly replacing those over time. Uh, we've identified that uh, we need a, either uh, a new well or to repair the water line for the Rotary Center. Um, that's, that's been identified and on our list, and uh, that's, a, that's gonna be a costly project. Do we, own, do we own the Rotary Center, or is that shared, is it the Leisure Services, or who owns that in this town? Oh. Municipality owns that? Oh, the night. Yeah, yeah it's, in, it's in Hebron, but we're on the town water line for the building.
we we just had it capped, and I'm I'm thinking it is the old two inch line. Yeah. There's no way to get water Is is the school service by the new line? No, we just had that line capped on our <laughs> end because the school dug a well probably three years ago. No. So we. <laughs> We were asked by the school board to cap off that line because they were fearful of, of something happening with that water line and w water coming into their so place. We're on well, we're no, we're, we're, we're still on town water, but we've identified that we've got some issues with our line, and we either will have to replace that line or dig a, dig a new well, which, you know, I haven't priced that, that out. I'm not sure which project would be more economical to do, what is to uh, dig a well or, or replace the line, because the line goes all the way out to the 340. People are always trying to do things on the cheap, and they convinced the town didn't want to do it, but politically they want to save a lot of money uh, on their water supply line, because they had to bring the line down from the 12-inch main that then went from Lake George to town, the old cast iron line. And they put a two-inch line down from the 12-inch line to the school. Now, you can imagine what little bit of piddle they could put out for a fire out of a two-inch line. But that's what they did. Who did that? Uh, Me? No. Gets close to the Moonies. <laughs> 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 I, I don't want to be critical of the deputy mayor, but they did that, and uh, um, wasn't well, a good we'll it wasn't a good decision. But what I'm amazed at is when they built the new municipal building, they had to put our water extend the water line out with sufficient capacity to do firefighting. Well, I thought they were going to hook the school up as part of that deal, and it hasn't been done. I'm amazed. Oh man. But, but seriously, that's the kind of thing that's been done in the past that we pay for today. So, oh, I wasn't, and I wasn't asking for blame. I was just, I was just like, how did that get through? How did somebody say, okay, that's all? Cliff, were you going to say something before Jeff says something? Well, I think it's one of the issues I ran for mayor over. You did? Yeah. Well, I lost, but that's what I said. It gets close to the Moonies. <laughs> He's right behind you there, Cliff. So oh my gosh! Great, almost over your head. I, I was just going to suggest, Frank, that you you may want to just make an appointment with Dave Ernst and have a conversation yeah. about that water line and what that would mean uh, before you go too far into it. I know that there's some uh, there's some concern about water quality issues when you have a lateral that goes that goes that far and would be used so infrequently, right? Because it's not a household, right? The water isn't, isn't being pulled through on a regular basis, so there would be some concern there. So have a chat with Dave uh, about that. I have talked with Chad, but... Um, so, so anyway, uh, what else do we have on our, our wish list here? And again, this, these are projects that we've identified. Um, probably we're looking now more in the uh, three or four year timeline that uh, we have a, a vacant building at the St. Ambrose ball field that's been vacant for some time. It used to be a storage room and a kind of like an announcer's booth. Um, so we've for years have been looking at that saying what can we use, make a good use out of that building because it's a concrete building. Is that um, the, where the canteen used to be? Yeah, it used to be like a canteen yeah. scores okay. right storage. Okay, corner. So we'd like to put washrooms in there because of the fact that smaller children are playing on St. Ambrose Field and the washrooms are way down at the senior field. So that's, that's one of the things we've identified. Uh, for those tennis players out there, our courts in town have not been resurfaced for quite some time. So that's, that's a big job in itself, but it's on our list uh, to, to, uh, to resurface those courts. Uh, ball field lights replacement at Broadbrook Park. Um, we constantly fight uh, issues with the lights. Um, 
We're dreading going out there this spring and turning them on because with all the high winds that we've had, um, we know that we're going to have lights that are out. Mm -hmm. basically, basically, from high winds, they blow out. So um, we have found a product that we're doing some, some research into that we may be able to look at switching over to LED and we may be able to look at uh, budgeting to replace one or two standards per year to get you know, the, the ball fields back working where they should be working. Just a question on that, Frank. Because of the, uh, the potential energy savings going to, going to an LED, is, are there any provincial programs or yes. efficiency novas? Okay. Yes, yep, for sure. Yeah, we would, we would qualify for, for, some, uh, for some programs if we did switch to LED. And then the last one was Thank with you. the Janet Smith soccer field. Um, we do have some fencing work that we're, we're looking at there. So, um, so my last slide is just, uh, it's kind of like, uh, this, this bulletin was developed by Recreation Nova Scotia back in 2012. And in small print, you see it says 2012 bulletin for municipal candidates. So I, I really like this type of thing. It, it just says recreation, why does it matter? And it matters for economic development, for positive community image, safety and security, health and wellness, environmental sustainability, and community leadership and development. And how can councils support recreation? They can support sustainable communities, keeping community recreation affordable, and maximizing investment in public recreation spaces. So that's all that I had. Cheers to an upcoming year. And I know that there's lots of, uh, lots of things on the town's plate. Um, so when all that uh, budget work is done and the dollars come out, we will work with the town the best that we can to make things happen. And Frank, just one of the recreation, why does it matter? I know every year we have the uh, communities and bloom judges come come in town and one of the stops they always make is talk to John Darcy and, and the uh, work that he does on the fields in and out of town and uh, some of the techniques that John has learned over the years and uh, the guys are always really impressed with the amount of work that John gets done for the amount of money he has to spend in the uh, and the manpower he has so uh, that's always one of the stops and they're really impressed with the work that uh, Yarmouth Recreation or Yarmouth Leisure Services does with the, with the amount of people, the amount of money that we spend. I'll, I'll make sure I convey that on to John, but last summer he was saying he's got to come up with some new material because uh, the last two years I think we've had Lake Milo on the, on the stop for Communities in Bloom and I think Milo's getting more uh, positive comments than he's been getting with his field turf and, uh, and uh, fertilizing and aerating maintenance that he does. So, so he's, so compost, okay. We gotta get, we gotta get him on the compost. The liquid gold. Your Worship, <clears throat> I, I'm gonna victimize Frank a little bit here, but just to start to get something on your radar. And, and, and I don't mean any, any, uh, anything personal about this, Frank, but your presentation, you know, when you talk about all of your capital and your needs for investment in facilities, it kind of speaks to uh, the fact that the agreement, which is over 20 years old now, that under which you operate, probably needs to be revisited, probably needs to be updated, and probably need to take a serious look at capital. Frank's, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but your capital budget's about $50,000 a year. I mean, we don't, we don't consider anything capital in the town unless it's over 25000 do we? Right. So, so it, it, is a, it is a very small budget, and he's got significant assets there that he's, he's doing his best to look after, but the formula for capital doesn't work. And, and so last year, when we, we, we restrained a bit on the, on the financial side, I believe it was your capital budget that suffered, Frank, was, is that correct? Yes, yes. Yeah, so I, I think we need to look at that. The other thing I think we need to look at <clears throat> and this is, again, it's not specific to recreation. We're going to use recreation as the example. For every man, woman, and child uh, in the town of Yarmouth, uh, Frank's current recreation budget ask uh, costs $49.40. Okay? Say that number again. $49.40 for every man, woman, and child 
for all of the recreation programs and services and events and facilities that Frank's department provides. So in the town. In the town. So that's not a that's not a it's not a high amount, I don't think. Uh, it's probably a good deal uh, when you consider costs of registering for other recreation or sport activities. However, uh, if you take the, the municipality of Yarmouth side, our partner, and you do the calculation on their side, it works out to $33.62. So every man, woman, and child in the town of Yarmouth is paying 50% more for their municipal recreation than every man, woman, and child who live on the other side of Prospect Street or live past the golf course. And so <clears throat> it's 50% more. Um, and that is because they have a greater population than we do. And nobody enjoys recreation more than people. Right? So the question is, is do we have the right formula when it comes to capital? Do we put enough in? Probably not. Um, do we have the right formula in terms of the cost sharing of the overall budget? Probably not. And so I'm putting this on your radar because it does not it does not apply only to recreation. I'm only using recreation because right. you gave me some numbers and it is an example of where when we sit down to partner, we think about one municipality, one municipality, and we do things 50-50. But those municipalities are not the same and they are not equal. And when we do things three ways, we usually say a third, a third, a third. And those three municipalities are not equal, and yet we, we burden our taxpayers seemingly with the, same, with the same burden. But it isn't the same burden when you break it down by the number of people. You can break it down by the tax base because we have a large commercial tax base. When you, when you look at uniform assessment, it is virtually the same proportions as population today. So uh, what I'm saying to you, and, and we'll talk more about it in future meetings, is that I think it's time for, <clears throat> for the three councils, and we're going to talk about it a bit next week um, in terms of cooperation. I think it's time to think about how we partner and the mechanics of how we partner and uh, make sure that, that you know, we need a viable town and we need viable municipalities. We aren't going to get that by taking an extraordinary burden on the town taxpayers uh, at, the, you know, at our expense, I guess, for, for the benefit of, of all. So uh, just something for you to think about. We've been thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, imagine. <coughs> Imagine if you got the 4940 for everybody that you represent, how much more you could do. Yeah, washrooms over the John's Club. Yeah. You have those self cleaning ones. The nice ones. Yeah. Frank, thank you. Thank you. Very much. Good stuff. Okay. So, yes, for Frank. Yeah. Frank, sorry, I had one other question. <clears throat> Your first slide, you had um, priorities or objectives or three things, increasing participation, improving quality of facilities, and improved customer satisfaction. Do you, do you measure those? We try to follow those in everything that we do. Um, and I guess it's part of our evaluation that we usually do with pro more with programs than anything. Um, but no, this is something, I, I didn't create this. This is something that was probably our previous recreation director had looked at, so, <laughs> or, or before that, so. Good. We won't name any names, Gushu. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good stuff. So, staff reports. Yes. Yes, let, do you want to take like two minutes, everybody? I know you got to get going, don't you? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right, so let's take two minutes and go. We'll put that in.